Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Quarantine Devotionals, Friday, July 24th, 2020. I hope you're all doing well this morning and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Of course, if you're listening in from Ontario or another time zone that's a bit ahead of the Pacific time zone that we live in, then yeah, hopefully you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. But for those of us who are out here in the East or in the Pacific uh, time zone, well, um, you know, I don't know what time you wake up at, but... Uh, um, but let's get rolling. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a, um, a cloudy day out here, but good news for those who are out here in Port Townsend and Squim area and there are places like this, the sun is going to break through today and it's supposed to be a pretty nice day actually. But, uh, but I did notice for the first time this morning, it kind of dawned on me. Actually, that's an interesting choice of words. It, it didn't dawn on me quite so much, uh, I was uh, looking outside about 5 a.m. and, you know, the days are getting a little bit shorter now. And uh, kind of a sad, um, I never liked that when that happens, uh, but it's kind of a sad thing when you realize that winter is once again on its way and uh, those days are getting shorter. But you know what? Despite the shortness of the days, God's grace and mercy is still very long. So let's, uh, let's go to him in prayer right now and ask for his help. Lord God, we want to thank you for, uh, again, just the fact that we do wake up today, that you've given us another day, another chance to worship you and to know you. And Lord, we can know you. We can know you through your creation that we see all around us, the fact that um, uh, you've put this beauty, the birds of the sky and, uh, and the, even the insects that we see, Lord, all reflect your artistry, the beautiful sky that we look at and the greatest creation that you've given, uh, given to us, uh, your own image, the people we see around us, Lord. We don't often think about uh, the goodness of just seeing people, but these people, everyone created in your image and we pray that we would see your goodness in everyone that we meet today, <clears throat> and that we would reflect that goodness back to them. But in order to do so, we need to be in touch with you and in touch with you through your word. So I pray that you give us a good time in it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, guys, uh, this morning we are going to consider Luke chapter 6. Uh, get your Bibles out. We're going to look at Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 37c to 38. Uh, that's, uh, we can just say 37 to 38, but the end part of verse 37 to verse 38. So get your Bibles open there, um, and I'll just see who's kind of with us this morning so far. Ben and Janet Lozano and uh, Barb Hyman, mom and dad, uh, no longer in Ontario, but they're out here in BC. We saw them this week, and that was pretty exciting, as we went up to Peace Arch Park and were able to walk across onto the Canadian side, and uh, they could come onto the American side without any kind of border patrol. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Carolyn, you're with us. Sherry, uh, oh, Sherry's asked the question, what's on the fireplace? So you guys may know that every morning, Sophia, uh, my daughter, my, my nine-year-old daughter, she decorates something on this fireplace. And um, this morning, you can't see it quite so well, but she was excited. Yesterday, she got a bunch of, um, well, she calls them gemstones uh, from somebody. And we have here, there is uh, um, some amethyst, I think it is, a, an amethyst geode. Uh, she got a big thing of quartz that she was pretty excited about. Oh, man, she was just beaming from ear to ear. Some, uh, some pyrite, uh, fool's gold and some other things. Uh, I think there's some more amethyst up there, but she was pretty excited. So she put those up on the fireplace this morning to, uh, to show everybody. And truly they are beautiful. We want to talk about God's goodness and mercy to us and the beauty of his creation. Hard to believe that there are millions of little geodes like this that are stuck inside of uh, rocks that we will never ever even discover. And yet he created every single one of them. Just amazing when you think about it, and he knows where every single one is. So I put, I'll put those back up, and that's what that is, Sherry. Anyway, um, yeah, so uh, McIntyres are here, and great to see everybody. Hey, guys, while you're opening your Bibles up to Luke chapter 6, again, I just want to take a minute to, um, to give you a book 
uh, that I think that every Christian should read. Um, I'm not going to give you a book. I'm going to give you a book recommendation. If you really, really want me to give you one, I'll get one for you. But uh, um, uh, this book is called Knowing God. And it's by a guy named J.I. Packer, who actually just died last week, 93 years old, but one of the greatest gifts to God's church uh, um, that uh, that I know of anyway, just a wonderful, I was going to say beautiful, but it doesn't sound very manly, but I'll tell you what, he was a beautiful Christian man, um, lived uh, uh, to help others know God, and one of the, I mean, he writ, wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles and dozens of books, <clears throat> but I think this is one of his best, if not his best, uh, a book that helps us to know our God, not just know about God, but to know God. As Packer says here, I'll just read you a little excerpt. I walked in the sunshine with a scholar who had effectively forfeited his prospects of academic advancement by clashing with church dignitaries over the gospel of grace. So he was walking with a, 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 uni, a Christian university professor who, who, held to the God, who held to what the Bible says, and, and he was fired because of it. But he says this, but it doesn't matter, said the scholar at length, for I've known God, and they haven't. The remark was a mere parenthesis, a passing comment on something I had said, but it has stuck with me and set me thinking. And he goes on to talk about the difference between knowing about God and truly knowing God. Knowing God in all of his holiness and all of his magnitude, but also knowing God on the most personal level, knowing God as your friend and your savior. And I'll tell you, there are few books that have been written that can help you to know God in such a deep and personal way with an appreciation for both the greatness of God, but also um, the way that God is willing to, to enter into uh, such a personal relationship with us. So guys, if you haven't read it, um, I would recommend getting this book. One thing we need to understand, if you get this book and you start reading it, is how uh, poor of readers we are and how shallow we are in our faith. Don't give up in the first chapter of this book. Uh, this is actually a fairly easy read, um, but easy mean is, is all relative. And uh, we, need to, we need to become better readers. If we really want to know God, um, we need to uh, know God who has, who has inspired people to write things like this. And so it will challenge you. It may challenge you in your reading a little bit, but it will definitely challenge you in your soul. And you will be glad you read it. Knowing God by J.I. Packer. If you're a Christian, you'll meet him one day. There's going to be a long line up in heaven to meet this guy. You can say, oh, I read your book. And he'll be glad to know that. Well, you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 37. Let's just read 37 and 38. <clears throat> and it says this, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Lord God, as we look at this short text, but very um, convicting text, I pray that you would help us to, to uh, imbibe these truths in our heart in such a way that it flows out of us to those around us, that we might be living representations of your goodness and your righteousness, and your holiness, so that people would be drawn to the difference they see in us, that ultimately that difference is Christ, that they would be drawn to Christ that they see in us. So help us to apply these truths as we meditate on them a bit today. Amen. You know, as when, uh, when we moved down here to the States, one of the things that messed me up every morning it's, in fact it still continues to mess me up is that when I would check the weather in the morning say in the middle of winter or something and it would say 37 degrees outside or 38 degrees 
Well, if you know about where I come from, that's not winter temperatures. Those are sweltering temperatures. We seldom hit 37, 38. And, you know, if you're going to reckon with those kind of weather forecasts, you have to realize that those are the degrees given in Fahrenheit. I grew up using Celsius, grew up in Canada. And so I've had to adjust the way that I understand temperature. In fact, I, I shouldn't say that. I haven't adjusted anything. I still check the, uh, the temperature in Celsius. And if you ask me what the temperature is, I'm going to give you a strange answer. You're not going to understand it if you're an American, because I have no clue what 70 degrees is. I have no clue what 80 degrees is. I know 90 is getting a little hot, but, um, but I really don't, still don't know what that is. Uh, 37, 38 degrees to me, golly, that is really, really hot. Uh, winter temperatures, those are zero. But I've had to adjust things a little bit. I've had to adjust the way that I measure temperature. I've had to adjust the way that I measure distance, kilometers to miles, because now I live in a different country. You know, when you become a Christian, you need to change the way that you measure things as well. And Jesus gives us a different sort of measurement unit in this text. He tells us that we need to change the way that we measure things. You don't live and measure things in the way that the world does anymore, your old country. You measure things using grace. So Jesus tells us here, let your measurement units be counted in grace. Let your measurement units now as a Christian be counted in grace. Why? Because Jesus tells us here that how you measure others reveals how you will be measured by God. How you measure others reveals how you'll be measured by God. Jesus tells us here in this text that, that how we treat others shows us how God is going to treat us. It's, it, it's going to reveal where we really stand with God on that day when he comes to judge us. And it shows us that only someone who has truly uh, known God's grace can show grace. You can only show grace to others, really show grace, if you have truly known God's grace. You see, the reason for that is because knowing grace requires an appreciation of your own personal sinfulness against God's righteousness. And this is something that we don't understand too well unless we are a Christian, unless we're made new and have some kind of, well, some kind of knowing of God. Knowing grace requires an appreciation of your own sinfulness. And we live in a world, and we grow up in a world, where sin really isn't thought much of. We're desensitized. We are used to seeing sin on a daily basis, and we're used to participating in sin on a daily basis. And the more that we see that, the more that we exercise sinfulness in our lives, well, the less it stands out. It doesn't stand out because we're not considering God. But the moment that God shows you his grace, he shows you something of his self, suddenly you have a whole different backdrop by which to measure things against. And you begin to measure your own sinfulness against God's righteousness. In fact, this is the very thing that drives us to ask Christ to save us because we get a picture of our sinfulness. And in order to know grace, uh, the, in order to show grace, we have to know our own personal sinfulness against the backdrop of God's righteousness. You know, showing grace to others comes as a result of appreciating the grace that you know now from God. You know, it's very easy for somebody who's not a Christian to understand on paper um, that, uh, that God's grace is a good thing, especially if we've sinned. That's a, just a theological knowledge. It's a theoretical knowledge of grace. So that's easy. That's easy. That's easy as understanding the difference between black and white. Very easy to understand the difference between black and white on paper. You have black ink and you have white ink, and we can see that the two are very different from each other. But <clears throat> we need a theologically informed knowing of grace. And when I say knowing, I mean like a sensing of it. And that's very different. That's the difference between somebody knowing what black and white really are and somebody who can actually feel the difference between darkness and light. Somebody who, say, uh, uh, has lived in blindness their whole life. 
and suddenly they're miraculously healed from from blindness. There's more than a theological knowledge of black or a theoretical knowledge of black and white to them. There is something that they feel inside. There's a whole world that's opened up for them in such a way that they can feel it. We saw it on a Little House on the Prairie the other night, which we watch every Sunday night, where Adam, that guy who was blind for for almost his whole life, he suddenly, his sight was restored, and you could see the joy. He just wanted to run everywhere. Guys, that is a difference. And to have that theologically informed knowing, inward knowing of grace, well, first it requires a desperation for God. And are you desperate to know your God? If you are, then you will know him through your study of the scriptures, and you'll want to know more about him. You want to know more about uh, uh, his goodness. You'll want to know more about his majesty. You'll want to know more about his mercy. You want to know more about his love. All of these things, and you will get it right here. You'll get it in the scriptures. And that's why it's so important, like as you're doing this morning, to spend time in God's word. A theologically informed knowing of grace, though, it requires also a work of God. It requires a work of God in you so that you will begin to see it. So if you're not a Christian this morning, um, and you're listening, you will not know and you cannot understand the depth of the grace of God. But you come to Christ and God flicks a switch. Actually, he doesn't just flick a switch. He makes you brand new, born again, so that you can understand and really uh, taste and see, as the Bible says, the goodness of God's mercy. And so only someone who has truly known God's grace can show grace. So the units we measure people's by, people by, if they're units of grace or they're units of, of just the world standards, they really show um, <clears throat> how we are going to be measured. Listen, Jesus says, do not judge or you will be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So if how we judge others, if how we judge others starts with a work of God's mercy in us, then that shows us that God's mercy will also factor into how we are judged. Listen, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat. Every single one of us, as Romans 14 says, we will all give an account to God someday. And how are we going to be judged? Well, it's shown in how we judge or the mercy that we extend to others. That's right. You know, we are judged according to our works. Now, wait a minute. I know you're going to say, whoa, no, that sounds pretty Roman Catholic. I'm not saying that we're saved by our works. We are saved by faith alone, and we're saved on the basis of Christ's work. But Christ's work in us produces good works. So we're saved by faith alone. But Scripture is very clear. In every instance of God's judgment in the New Testament, we are saved by faith alone, faith in Christ alone, but we are judged according to the works that that faith produces in us. So when we stand before God and he looks at the mercy that we've shown to others, that will be the basis on which he judges us. One of the things, by, uh, ways by which he judges us. The mercy we've shown will be accounted for. We don't need to, to look any further than Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35 to see this. Matthew 18, 21 to 35, let me read this. Peter said to him, Lord, how many times... Uh, could my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? And Jesus says, <clears throat> I tell you, not as many as seven, but 70 times seven. So uh, it says, for this reason, the kingdom can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began to settle, the, settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he had no way to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. At this, the fellow slave fell down and begged him uh, and began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. 
On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt you uh, debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back everything that was owed. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each, uh, if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Guys, this tells us if we've really understood God's mercy or if we have not. How you measure others reveals how you'll be measured. Secondly, also in this text, it says, let me just turn back to it here, Luke chapter 6. Uh, it says, um, forgive and you will be forgiven. How you forgive will reveal how you will be forgiven. In that day when you stand before God, how you forgive will reveal how you will be forgiven. You know, forgiveness here is specifically mentioned because forgiveness is probably one of the most difficult things that we have to do as Christians. It's difficult. I think this is why it's difficult because it costs us our pride to forgive other people. If someone wrongs you, it's very easy to hold something over them. You have something to hold over them that shows in your heart, it may not even show to anyone else, but it shows to you that you're better than them. And so that's a proud thing that we get to hang on to. <clears throat> Once someone wrongs you, also it gives you a reason to hate. Well, you may say, well, I don't hate people. I don't, I, I don't, I don't have this animosity for mankind. Well, I believe that you probably don't, but I also believe that there is still sin that's left within you. I know there's sin left in every single one of us. And wherever there is sin that's left, there is a hating of that which represents God. And every person represents the image of God. And so if someone wrongs you, that hate, that sin within you, it, it's stirred up and it gives you a basis by which to fulfill that hatred for God's image once again. Forgiveness is difficult because of these reasons. But I think the reason that Jesus, or one of the reasons that Jesus uses forgiveness as a test case here is because uh, it is one of the truest tests of whether you've understood God's grace. You know, if someone robs you, you can get over that. You'll get money back again. If someone hits you, well, you'll heal up. If someone abuses you in one way or another, whether it be verbally or, uh, or, or physically, and I hope that's not the case, um, uh, but if they do, time will pass and things will start to heal again. All of these things is easier than getting over forgiving somebody. Why? Again, because forgiveness costs us a lot more. It costs us pride, which we hang on to so dearly. But forgiveness is proof to God. And that day that you stand before him, it proves to God that you understand some things when he judges you. It proves to God that you have understood something of his forgiveness to you. It proves that you have understood that your sin to, against God is so much greater than the way that anyone can sin against you. You know, we hold these things over people and refuse to forgive them because of how they've wronged us. But guys, we have wronged God so much more. And if we forgive others freely as God forgave us, that is proof when we stand before God that we have understood something of his mercy toward us. It also proves to God that when, when, uh, when he sees the way that you forgive others, that his image has been restored to you. The Bible tells us that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And that work that he began to you is the restoring of his image in you, who bears his image. And so when you stand before him and he sees how you have shown mercy and grace to others and forgiven others, he sees something of himself, and that is proof that you are a child, a genuine child of God, bearing the same DNA as the Father has, so to speak. 
and shows that to God. It also shows God in that day of judgment that you don't operate, that you are a citizen of his kingdom because you don't operate according to that old measurement system anymore. The old measuring measurement system that you functioned according to, the one that this world functions according to, is that eye for eye, tooth for tooth. If someone wrongs you, then you have a right to wrong them. The, the, uh, as the, we call, um, we call it the lex talionis, the law of the claw, the Old Testament law, the way that the world functions. No, you don't measure according to that lex talionis anymore, the world's way of measuring uh, justice. Instead, you measure according to a new measurement system that we call grace, the grace of God. And it shows God that you belong to that new country and with, with, it uses that new measuring system, a measuring system of grace, and because you understand how to forgive others and how to administer grace to people. Guys, <clears throat> how you forgive will reveal how you will be forgiven. How you measure others reveals how you will be measured in that day when we stand before God. And if we truly belong, if we're truly citizens of God's kingdom, then we will use measurements of grace. And we will know how to dish that out because it's been dished out to us. So let your measurement units not be counted in retribution, not be counted in the way that this world functions and the way that you and I so naturally function according to our sinful natures. No, let your measurement units be counted in grace, God's grace, 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 wonderful grace, as the old hymn says, right? And you will reflect in the image of God and you will be judged according to God's grace. And I know that you want that. I know that I certainly want that. Guys, it's possible through the goodness of Jesus to, uh, to know that grace. Well, those are my thoughts for this text this morning. Perhaps you've had some others, but I want to urge you over the weekend to spend some time in God's Word each day. It is, it is the place where we should uh, begin our days and maybe end our days um, uh, so that our lives are centered around Him. Um, just a reminder for those who are part of San Juan Baptist Church that, uh, that today... At 4 o'clock, there is the sign holding out at uh, Highway 20 and Mill Road um, to be a witness to those, point them to Christ throughout the day. Uh, go, you know, get out to church Sunday morning. As Christians, we are called to get out to church, so don't take every opportunity to do that. I can't think of any other things that I need to let you know about. I hope that you have a great day and a great weekend and enjoy some of the sunshine that is coming your way. Um, why don't we close in prayer this morning? Lord God, we want to thank you for your grace. Uh, it is more than abundant to us, Lord. We don't realize it. We certainly don't until we take some time to actually reflect on it. But even then, a lifetime of reflecting on your grace isn't enough to, um, to let us know just how great it is. That day is coming when we will know it. Uh, and maybe somebody's listening this morning who isn't a Christian, who doesn't know your grace. Maybe they think that they do know your grace, but they haven't put their trust in, in Jesus. Lord, we pray that everyone who's listening this morning, whether they're Christian or not, would be drawn close with, to you by an appreciation of your grace. That as Packer said, that we would know you, not just know about you, but know you in the very depths of our being by coming to Christ and surrendering our lives to Christ and, and uh, spending time and thinking about what your word says. God, help us to reflect your image to a world that needs so badly uh, hope and peace. And we pray that we would be the cause of people being drawn to Christ, again, because of the grace that they see in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining me this morning. And I, uh, I'll i see you, if I don't see you on Sunday, well, maybe we'll see you back here next Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock a.m. Bye for now.